today morning, interestingly, I received a message from someone on my WhatsApp with a photo of a woman carrying a matka or an earthen pot, as it is called, with a quote which said, once you carry your own water, you will learn the value of every drop. That is such a simple yet powerful message on the value of water and, and so very uh, important and you know, meaningful for today uh, because the theme of the World Water Day is valuing water and it has been chosen to highlight the value of water in our daily lives. According to the UN, the, water, uh, the value of water is much more than its price. Uh, enormous and complex value across the society and business uh, and for our natural environment. So the World Water Day, as we know, is observed to raise awareness about the water crisis the world is facing and to support the achievement of SDG 6, which is water and sanitation for all by 2030. The UN has also highlighted that one in three people live without safe drinking water. And by 2025, half of the global population will be living in areas where water is scarce. So therefore, valuing water transcends every discourse and intervention to how different sources of water are managed, how different uses of water are balanced, and ultimately, how we replenish and recharge water. It links directly to how stakeholders make water a top priority in their business, society, social and environmental agenda. Uh, today is also seeing the launch of the Jal Shakti Abhiyan, Catch the Rain by our Honorable Prime Minister. We from the Fiki Water Mission have been creating awareness around sustainable water management, sharing best practices of corporate water stewardship, water use efficiency and partnerships. And last year, we partnered with the National Water Mission to conduct a series on Catch the Rain. Today's webinar is not only our tribute to the World Water Day, but also to raise the discourse on corporate water stewardship. And therefore our theme, corporate water stewardship, making a priority for businesses. We have a very distinguished panel of speakers who are very representative set of people from the key stakeholders, that is government, end user industry, solutions provider, and NGO. We will have opening statements from those who are at the helm of the Fiki Water Mission first, followed by a special address by member, Central Groundwater Board, and a panel discussion led by our lead of the Fiki Water Mission Corporate Water Stewardship Working Group. I would now like to invite Ms. Nenalal Kidwai, who's chair of the Fiki Water Mission, something that she herself started in 2011. She also chairs the India Sanitation Coalition and is chairman of Ad Advent Private Equity, as well as has held the position of head of HSBC India. So over to you, Ms. Kidwai. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. And for that very evocative start uh, where we have such a traditional image of women with their matkas on their head and Yes, for every woman who has carried water on her head, the value must certainly be enormous for that water. And thank goodness that we can see an improvement of this agenda in the country going forward. But let me start by wishing everyone a happy World Water Day. And may the value of water be something which we truly treasure. And on this occasion, of World Water Day, I welcome you all uh, on behalf of the Fiki Water Mission to this webinar, which is on corporate water stewardship, making it a priority for businesses. It is an area we have worked in from the very outset, and one which I am glad to say is seeing more and more traction. The theme for this year's World Water Day is valuing water, and I believe really rightly chosen in the context of the present scenario, where not only are we seeing growing water scarcity as one of the leading challenges for sustainable development across the board, uh, India certainly, but also elsewhere in the world. But in terms of valuing water, we have to begin to look at how we might develop pricing mechanisms for it. And if there's one time when we have realized the value of this water, it is through the COVID pandemic, 
where traditional messages of washing uh, hands and uh, hygiene and the whole wash agenda is right up there in terms of what we need to do at a country level. Now, the United Nations has correctly pointed out that the value of water is about much more than price. I believe it is also about price, but of course it is much more than price because water has enormous and complex values, whether it is for agricultural production, food security, industry, which is of course what we will be discussing today, and economy and the integrity of the natural environment. So however we look at it, the circular impact of water is critical. And to effectively navigate this water crisis, we need holistic strategies. We need to address all aspects of water management, both supply side as well as the demand side. At the FIKI Water Mission, we support the agenda of sustainable water management uh, amongst corporates primarily, and that too through three focus areas. First and foremost, industrial water use efficiency, where we have in fact published a number of knowledge uh, uh, journals which explain how different industries and companies in those industries actually look at water use efficiency. The second key area is PPP in urban wastewater management. As you all well know, wastewater is a critical agenda now under the Swatch Bharat mission as well. And the public-private partnerships therein uh, are key for our program at a country level in terms of wastewater management. And the third and key area is corporate water stewardship, which we will address in some detail today. Now, the Corporate Water Stewardship Program under the FIKI Water Mission focuses on policy advocacy as well as industry's engagement in driving how business and industry look at water as a top priority, both for CSR, but even more important for its own business operations. We set up a special working group this year to give impetus to this agenda. And this is being led by Sangeeta Takral from Diageo, uh, who is leading the corporates in the working group and who will be moderating the panel. And I'm delighted that she has assumed the leadership of this particular working group for us uh, this year. Now, corporates increasingly recognize that world's water challenge uh, is clearly significant in terms of the risks it imposes in terms of the communities the communities we serve, the communities which uh, exist around our factories, the ecosystems, and of course, therefore the impact on our own operations. As corporates, we also acknowledge that we have an important role to play in advancing water security by managing water use and wastewater discharge, engaging in collective action and responsible water governance, contributing to increased access to water, sanitation and hygiene, and water, fortunately, is increasingly becoming an integral part of business and the CSR agenda for corporates as well. Now, even as corporates are taking intensive efforts, both within and outside the fence, in conserving water and contributing to sustainable management of shared freshwater resources, we at FIKI have also had now, over the years, instituted awards where we celebrate what is working with a view to encourage others to replicate this. And we have great examples, as you will see from some of the awards we've given, where corporates in various sectors are carrying out stewardship initiatives across India, adopting innovative technologies and practices, engaging directly with communities. And they're doing this with the help of strong partnerships, both on the ground, but also with local governments, people, grassroots and civil society organizations. And I have no doubt that it is where we get all the stakeholders in together, particularly the community, that we see a solution which then stays embedded for a period. Otherwise, it disappears with every collector that comes and goes. And it may even assume uh, a very short life, lifetime or lifespan for that project, rather than being something which sustains when the community, in fact, 
takes it over and administers it. So community engagement is very key and hence NGOs and their role in ensuring that communities stay engaged becomes very critical as well. Now interventions such as watershed management and management of groundwater recharge, the aquifer management, water conservation, rainwater harvesting, revival of traditional water structures, water ATMs, these have all been areas for corporates both on the CSR fund and while using efficiency, including water recycling and reuse, the use of treated wastewater in existing business as well. And we have many examples. Uh, ITC, in fact, stands out as uh, one of our awardees in the water stewardship program that they have implemented with objectives of drought proofing agriculture and creating water security for all catchment shareholders. And this is done in partnership with NGOs and institutions and implementation is seen right through from conserving soil moisture to water harvesting structures to water efficiency of their own units. HSBC has implemented WASH projects to provide clean drinking water and sanitation to all. So we see this refrain across companies that are coming into uh, water management in an effective way. As far as water stewardship goes, it's not only a focus agenda for end users of industry, but there's an increasing trend toward water stewardship by financial institutions as well. And we've seen examples, I mentioned HSBC, but Indusin Bank, SBI, Yes Bank, and others. Now, as corporates align CSR initiatives with various government initiatives, uh, such as Catch the Rain, which Rita alluded to a little earlier, uh, we also are aiming at improving groundwater and restoring the health of the country's aquifers, which is a big uh, necessity, in fact, for the country. And to that effect, I'm delighted that we have with us uh, Mr. Sanjay Marwa, member CGWB, who will share his perspectives on how corporates can partner in groundwater conservation efforts. We are already witnessing climate and natural disasters which impact us in India and of course the world. And the focus on water as a climate adaptation area with extreme need to ensure that business and society remain resilient to future climate shocks is critical. And I can tell you as an erstwhile banker, water risk is something which banks are clearly analyzing and looking at as we look at funding companies going forward. I want to end by saying that the scope for corporates to make water a top priority in this decade of action is immense and there's no better time than now. This can be achieved with partnerships the partnerships need to be robust and mutually reinforcing. We need every peg to the stool to stand to make the stool be stable. So welcome to all of you once again. Thank you. Rita, back over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kidwai, for that very inspiring address. I now move on to uh, Mr. Mukund Vasudevan, who is the co-chair of the Fiki Water Mission, former MD of Ecolab India. And he also advises private equity companies on investments in sustainability and industrial space and serves on the board of Q-Express, which is a cross-border logistics startup. Thank you, Rita. Uh, I'm assuming sound is fine. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Rita, and uh, thank you, uh, Naina, for uh, the uh, you know great start to uh, to share sharing with our audience what Fiki does um, around water, uh, and uh, wishing all of, all the audience members here, um, all the participants, uh, a really warm um, World Water Day. Um, on this occasion, you know, I thought I would go a little deeper into something, Naina alluded to, which is around pricing. Um, and uh, But start kind of at a very macro level and then go down into a little more detail on pricing. It's a very complex topic on, on water, uh, water pricing. And it's a very topic which uh, uh, creates a lot of uh, emotions and it's not easy to kind of solve. For no government, no uh, municipality has it been an easy one to solve. 
but I thought I'd throw some light on what has been done and how it has been done and why it is important. Uh, let me first start with just kind of highlighting the value of water. Um, what, I was in conversation with one of the largest uh, oil, private oil companies in India, uh, Kane Energy's CEO, um, uh, for around five years back. And I was talking to him about business and I wasn't talking to him about water. And I asked him, what are your top three priorities? And I was astounded to see that he started with water. The number one priority for him was water. It wasn't oil, it wasn't operations, it wasn't people, it was water. And the reason for that, as many of you know, is Kane Energy uh, is based in Rajasthan, in Barmer, or majority of the operations is there, which is a water-starved area. They need water to produce oil. They need water to, um, they produce water also from the ground, which needs to be treated and put back into the earth or put back uh, treat it because otherwise it creates a problem for the local community. And in short, if they don't have water, their business would not survive. Now, compare that to the price of water most of us are paying. If you now think about business continuity, which is, um, which is at risk, the value of water suddenly goes up. On a lighter note, I'll kind of touch on something else, which is uh, addresses the value of water. Uh, my com one of my previous companies, Pentair, we had done some CSR work uh, uh, where we had installed a drinking water purification station uh, in the west in western UP. Um, and uh, this was an area which was not too far from the Yamuna, but the Yamuna was too polluted or would go dry, so they had to use groundwater. But the groundwater was really, really brackish, salty, had fluorine, had all kinds of contaminants in it. Um, so we had installed a drinking water station there, which a local entrepreneur was running and supplying water. So we did that at a nominal, uh, at a nominal cost, water was being sold and all the villagers were more than happy to pay for it. Um, now, typical problem with such water stations is they don't last long. You come there a year later and they don't last. So one of the ways we solve that problem is by you making sure a local entrepreneur was pricing the water appropriately and selling it. And when I, a year later, when we visited, just to do a reconnaissance and to see how is it performing, the moment we entered um, the, um, the village, one of the young men came up, to, came up to us and fell on our feet. You know, this is very embarrassing to say, okay, why did he fall on our feet, right? We've done, we supplied a drinking water station, but it's really not that big a deal that you have to fall on our feet. And after he stood up, he told us he had, he had fallen on our feet because the water which had been supplied to the village had ensured he would get married. Until then, the women in the village, women around the village were not willing to come to the village because it was understood that the water there was, was bad. So now if you want to think about the value of marriage, and I leave that to each one of your interpretations, that is the value of water. All right, so uh, let me now kind of go to pricing water. All right, before I go there, everybody understands there's a problem with water and there are different ways of solving it. There is a demand you can address. You can reduce the demand side. Um, you can address the supply side. But the third leg is pricing. And without pricing, it's very difficult to solve the other legs also. And let me touch on why, right? One, if you price water appropriately, you actually manage the demand appropriately. Now, it doesn't mean everybody needs to be priced the same way, but it also it, it, it can be different tiered kind of pricing. Um, the second is that uh, even on the supply side, you know, McKinsey had done the study around water um, and had said that majority of the big bang opportunities to, to manage the water crisis are around demand management. If you can reduce demand, you get a much better payback on any amount of money you spend. The, but then the more expensive ones tend to be around the supply side. But if the pricing of water is not right, the supply side equation where it is expensive, it requires uh, funding from banks, funding from equity partner partners becomes much, much more difficult because pricing is not being right, basically means payback will be low, IRR will be low. And last but not the least, the other reason pricing is so important is cross subsidies. As I said, tiered pricing is important. Cross subsidies will play a really big role in terms of um, agriculture, rural, rural water being priced appropriately, 
and urban domestic use and um, also um, industrial use being priced appropriately so it can cross sub subsidized where water is not available or there is a, an inability for people, especially in a country like India to pay. Um, so again, pricing needed for one, the demand side management. Second, it is needed for um, the supply side to make projects more viable. And uh, last but not the least, it, um, it ensures cr that cross subsidies are managed appropriately. So again, alluding to this McKinsey study, they said that in, in India, if the price of the water was on average in, across the country increased by two rupees. Now that's a fairly substantial amount, right? But compared to the current price, but if it is increased by two, per, two rupees, 90% of the supply side projects would suddenly become less than five years payback, which is much better than most of them are currently. That itself will make it much more bankable. So pricing is critical, right? So how do you price, right? One way to price is to look at costs and say cost plus. Uh, now, everybody knows that with, based on the two examples I gave you, that's not the real value of water. You cannot just price at cost plus, right? There is a real value to this. And given that some people will may not be willing to pay that cost plus, you again need to price it a little higher to ensure that the cross subsidy work. The other way is to create an efficient market for water where water is traded. Now water, unlike energy or currency or, uh, or money is not easily movable. So it's a little difficult to kind of really make this an efficient market where you can understand pricing. So that too is kind of not, not easy. The third and probably the best way is to, is to estimate the true value of water. And there are various um, countries which have done this. Australia has done this in a phenomenal manner. Um, it, there have been um, studies. Um, there's a study which was done by Microsoft and Ecolab and a company called True Value, which actually so I built a, something called a water risk monetizer. And uh, they take various inputs to come out with the value of water in any given basin. So you need to do this at a basin level. So what does real value of water take, take into account? One, it takes into water the incoming cost of water, right? Now, which is the cost plus I was talking about. What does it take to purify water? What does it take to, uh, to distribute water until it reaches a tap, right? The second, factor which is uh, involved in pricing or true, truly valuing water, water is the outgoing water cost. Now you may wonder what is the cost of outgoing? But again, that has a cost because one, it needs to be purified before it can be taken into reverse. Second, it needs to be distributed. And third, if it leaves any lasting pollution, that needs to be remedied. That also has a cost. So the value, way to value the outgoing cost of water is what's the cost of treating that outgoing water so that it again becomes portable or, or usable by people. Right. The third element is business disruption. Now, um, this is the case I was talking about where you have situations where, um, for example, in, uh, in the Aurangabad district, in certain summer months, water supply to industries is shut off just because there isn't sufficient water to be to supply agriculture, domestic use, as well as industries. In other cases, water is um, it, it has been priced so high for industry that it becomes unviable for that industry to manage. Uh, same with wastewater. Wastewater treatment, if it becomes too expensive, then the industry becomes unviable. In many cases, textiles is a good example of where this happens. Um, so. Business disruption risk, again, needs to be valued. And the last piece is uh, looking at it now and in the future, because it's not just now. It's not a static image. In the future, the demand may increase. In the future, the uh, ecosystem you're living in, which is the community, the agriculture, everything may change. Again, that needs to be taken into, into account. Now, all these need to be put into an economic model at a basin level, and then the true value of water can come out. I, you know, I, I'm not going to be talking to you about all the ways in which this can be done. There are multiple models out there. There are NGOs who specialize in this uh, and there are governments, other governments which have done it. But what I would encourage is one industry, all of us as participants to be aware 
that there is a cost to water, not just industry, but even agriculture to be aware that there is a cost, true cost to water. Agriculture may not survive if there is insufficient water in its current form may not survive. Um, and I'd also last, I'd like the water solution providers to be aware that in order to make the supply side projects, whether it's a, a recycling project or whether it's a, um, a water treatment or a desalination plant, in order to make these projects viable, pricing of water is critical. So uh, what I would suggest is, Vicky, uh, we'd be glad to kind of work with all of you on this, take it up consistently with the government. I would love to hear the government's view on how we can do this more appropriately. Uh, I know this is a, a model which is constantly being worked on, um, but it can always be improved until we reach that true value. For example, even in a PPP project, I would say maybe we start with, uh, when it's being reverse auctioned, uh, we start with a floor price which uses the true value of water rather than the cost of water. So thank you all. Um, sorry for the brief economics lesson, but I hope this was useful as a primer to be able to kind of think about water and the true value as we, uh, as we celebrate with the World Water Day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mukund, uh, for uh, really uh, touching upon this very important topic of the true value of water for every stakeholder. And I must say it was an in-depth, important lesson that all of us uh, got. So thank you very much. I will now move on to our second co-chair, Ms. Reshma Anand, uh, who's also co-chairing the Fiki Water Mission and is the CEO of Hindustan Unilever Foundation, uh, which was set up in 2010. Uh, it is a corporate foundation focused on water conservation, governance, and behavioral change in water use. So over to you, Reshma. Thank you, Rita. And in a way, warm welcome to everyone. Um, you know, as we keep talking about, uh, you know, the value of water, and I heard, uh, you know, Mukun's anecdote, I think one of the first experiences that I had as a skeptic on water governance was when I made a visit to a, to actually, uh, you know, a, a district, uh, you know, a village in Aurangabad, and we sat with the Panchayat has created a very sophisticated water budget and they said, well, from all our water sources, this is the water we have. This is this is our need for drinking, for livestock and for agriculture. And there was actually a discussion in the community of how they had to cut back, you know, how they wanted to change their crop mix so that there would be water set sufficiently available to, to everyone. And I, and I think that for me, it was a it was an interesting moment because, you know, I was wondering, I come from Delhi where as residents of a building, we can't discuss and decide on what the order of, you know, car parking should be, right? And we can't, you know, which is on public space, we can't actually get consensus there. And here you have, you know, a large village community coming together and actually understanding the spirit of, you know, what a shared resource is and therefore how it's everyone's responsibility to actually manage it and govern it so that it's available to everyone, you know, equitably and responsibly as well. Now, the reason why I share this incident also is that if we had continued to just do, you know, water, water management and efficiency with one degree of separation from the business and not really veered and steered beyond those boundaries, we probably would not understand that there are ways of, of doing this, you know, with community engagement. And then I also, you know, mentioned that. And I think this is really where I wanted to bring out the role of CSR, um, you know, Estimates on CSR, you know, keep varying depending on the study. But if we say, let's say about 10, 10 to about 13,000 crores annually goes into, you know, CSR support by companies. Uh, even today, I mean, two thirds of it goes into health and education or what's called human development support. Uh, but it's quite uh, fascinating how just about less than 15% actually goes into the environment and in, in conservation of resources. And it's surprising because, you know, as Mukut also mentioned, companies and industry recognizes that water is going to be, is and is a significant business risk. You know, the WEF's outlook for every single year for the last five years has had water and the environment and, and extreme climate events as key business risks. You know, the World Bank's actually very clearly set out that countries like India stand to lose at least 6% of their GDP if they don't manage water scarcity. And often when we see why is water not even like part of, let's say, the top three issues that, you know, CSR is addressing, the response typically is, but well, we don't know how to measure, you know, health and education, C 
seems to be more measurable in terms of outcomes, which again seems to be counterintuitive because you know what is actually very very measurable and you know impact is attributable whether we want to look at food security, climate risk management, or even rural prosperity. About a dollar spent on water will create at least seven times the returns, and this is a meta average. And you know if we look at even our 20 times over, right? And it's quite interesting that when there is such a compelling, you know, case for water as an engine for economic growth, uh, why are we still resisting or why are we not acknowledging it as an area where corporate CSR support could actually extend? I mean, yeah, they say that we need just about under 2% of, you know, the world's GDP to solve for, you know, the water crisis that, uh, that is clearly, you know, headed our way. And with very clear, you know, areas of investment, whether it's providing for drinking water, sanitation, wastewater recycling, you know, ecosystem management of, you know, of water, of managing pollution, and also bringing in, you know, constructive and more equitable regulation. So, you know, how we can get there is clear. You know, two percent or less than two percent of the world's GDP is actually required to solve for, you know, the world's water crisis. We're talking about two percent CSR contribution in India, and you know, how can we actually make sure that this really becomes catalytic? I acknowledge that it's still a drop in the ocean compared to the kind of investments that government makes, right? But how can we, you know, create, uh, you know, the kind of let's say blueprints for even government on, you know, how we can solve for this issue at the scale of the district, at a state, and you know, and even at the national level. So. I think the, the 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 power of this collective as the Fiki Water Mission is really to actually drive this and say, well, two percent is extremely powerful. Done well, you know, done scientifically, you know, it can actually create a very compelling, you know, case for why, you know, investing in water is not just mitigating business risk, but it's also, you know, unleashing the kind of economic engine that uh, water can be, and that's probably why all these conversations and dialogues are always very exciting. So thank you. Thanks, Rita. Thank you. Thank you, Reshma. And uh, that was also a very, very interesting insight from you. So we heard today, uh, uh, till now, what we've heard is, uh, you know, the reflections on the, on the theme of today's uh, World Water Day. Uh, were touched upon by the chair of the Fiki Water Mission and our co-chairs touched upon the true value of water and how water can be driven to the top of corporate CSR agenda. Uh, now we'll move on to Mr. Sanjay Marwaha, who is uh, the uh, regional director of Central Groundwater Board, Ministry of Water Resources, Ganga Rejuvenation, Government of India. During the past 30 years, he's been credited with a number of studies related to various facets of groundwater, especially managed aquifer recharge in parts of semi-arid areas of the country. He's also been associated with compilation of five volumes issued by the government of, uh, of India on various topics of groundwater recharge and has authored more than 40 publications in national and international forums on various aspects of hydrogeology. He's also co-authored a book called Clean and Sustainable Groundwater in India by Springer Publications and is currently associated with one of the most ambitious projects ever taken for mapping of aquifers of India. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, invite Mr. Marwaha to make his address. Thanks a lot. Uh, am I audible? Is it uh, or there is there some issue? Yes, you are. Thank you. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank uh, uh, everybody at Kiki to give me such a wonderful opportunity to share our views uh, regarding the water, and especially on this very auspicious day. I found it today on this occasion of the World Water Day, which uh, we celebrate every year. And then we try to address the whole thing. Uh, today, uh, Honorable Prime Minister, in his uh, Opening remarks uh, during the launching of the Jal Shakti Abhyan uh, in the morning, uh, he said that we need to store more water 
and which otherwise gets wasted and try as best as possible to utilize them to the charges to the phone. Uh, we need to, the motor is to catch the rain where it falls in the way. Uh, now let's uh, analyze the catch the rain where it falls in the way. Uh, Indian subcontinent is one of a very peculiarly monsoon type of a climate where uh, you can catch the rain only few days in a year. You cannot catch it in a year because it doesn't fall. And when it falls, uh, it falls sometimes in such a intensity that even then you cannot uh, catch it. It might have to go as runoff to the sea or to a small river lakes. That is another issue attached to it is that when you try to uh, tap this water going through the streams, uh, it comes out from a watershed or somewhere. Uh, some or other, uh, you need to tackle this also because the water which is uh, coming out of a watershed, uh, you need to treat it, you need to close it. So it's very important that we have a very small span of uh, across the country, it's a large country, except for the east and northeastern part of the country, and certain, uh, certain southern parts, so most of the time we have the area of the family. And we need to take enough measures uh, to conserve when it falls. The dependency on the groundwater is increasing since independence, since rather since 70s. Uh, this is basically because of the uh, technology which came into being, where the two wells were sunk, and the groundwater was lifted. And earlier it was simply by the way of rope and buckets or the moats. We, we did never had that much quantity of water which was pumped out of the aquifer. Probably we never wanted. The dependency uh, you can reach um, that is from 85 percent is from the rural domestic, more than 50 half of population is the urban area, and more than 60 percent of the uh, irrigation needs are dependent on the water. There's no factor. Actually, it's a problem which uh, started in the last century. It's continuing in the this century, and we have started feeling the birds, so we are taking it very really we are taking it very seriously. It's not just a problem. And imagine what will happen in the next century. We cannot keep our eyes closed as always. That we will not survive in the next century. Why should we? Do? But I, I like to remind everybody that we, we work with good, good karma. Everybody tries to do the good. Why we try to because we expect that something good will in turn come back to us. Or at least my sense will be listened or something like that. I mean, our, most of our religious scriptures across the different uh, religions, if you take everywhere, at the most of the religions, they talk about the water and they talk about the utility. There's no factor. So, if we, if, if we are going to come back in the next century as another rebirth, or even the later part, how I'm going to handle it. Maybe it's too hard. You know, uh, in one of the uh, Hindu scriptures, uh, they quote something from Gita where Lord Krishna says that if a person, uh, if any soul which is born, it never brings it with itself anything. Whatsoever it does or it, I mean, to do anything which it needs or it requires anything, it, it requires from this world itself, whether it requires food to eat, whether it requires food to wear, or whatsoever it requires, it requires from the, this world. And you know, if we have, if we believe in the karma theory once again, and again, then we need to repay it also. We have uh, repayment loans to the mother, father, then we have to give to the nature also, mother earth also. We need to give it. So it's a bound duty of every person. We must realize it very clearly. We need to 
repay what we are going to utilize, which was not ours. And we must do it some or other to do good to this particular resource that we have. Uh, now, uh, the most very uh, I mean, nice talk by Mr. Vasudevan, and, and it was very, I mean, it was really good about it. Let's talk about the price of the water which is getting the, I mean, the issue these days. I'd like to tell you there are two types of water. One is the value of the water. One is extractive value of the water and one is non-extractive. Extractive volume of the water is that of the groundwater. That you when you extract, you pay a price to it. But there are certain non-extractive also. You need not to extract, but still you pay the price. Or you go, I mean you do it. For example, if anybody has gone to famous Puri uh, Jagannath, and they say that the prasad is prepared uh, with the gangwell, the groundwater, and it is uh, supposed to be very precious uh, people, everybody likes to have it. So, I mean, uh, what will happen or uh, the economic value of the water, uh, what will happen that if you do not have this source at uh, your disposal, so that is the real value of anything. So I have an industry, I utilize the water, it's based on water, it doesn't mean it is water intensive even then. If, even if it is not water intensive, but I utilize any X quantity, smaller quantity of water. But if that water was not there, what would have been the options to me? What would have been the cost? And let me remind you, probably this is the only commodity sold, at least in India, which does not have cost for the raw material. Even if even a potato chips packet has probably a potato, it is maybe the they might have been procured at two to five rupees and selling at uh, 200 rupees. But how about water? I remember the bottles uh, since last so many years when they were coming on the tables during the conferences. Uh, they used to cost uh, 10 to 12 rupees and today also is 20. So that means there is no cost as to the raw materials, only the cost which is to the purification, shelf life, increasing the shelf life, packaging. Delivery and all those things. Are, I'm not a economist, and, and frankly, I'm not an industry. I'm a pure hydrographer, but I, I have some concerns. So I'm just sharing. So we, we need to look at because you know it's because we we, we are born in a uh, uh, I mean in, in those days where this uh, water is a this groundwater was never priced. So it was a problem of plenty earlier. In 60s there was no issue. In 70s there was no, not any issue. So. We probably it's an issue of the mindset and it, obviously the next generation or next around 25 or 50 years ago, so this mindset is going to change as we have already discussed in the Obviously, uh, you are, I mean, I'm, I'm, I perfectly agree with Mr. Vasudeva that we cannot measure this water. It's very, very, very difficult, especially the deeper groundwater. It's very difficult. We can measure the sh shallow groundwater, which is uh, overexploited at so many places. You must have seen a lot many reports where we are talking about it. There are so many blocks of the 20 25 percent blocks are water squares, and remaining areas are less water squares. So, uh, the issue is that of the groundwater is we cannot actually say that I have a land and this much two liter of water belongs to me because it's a common pool resource. Everybody around my uh, uh, building or my house from where I have the two liter of water stored in, uh, beneath my land, uh, the other person also. But the moment I start pumping it, I draw from the my neighbor also. It's a common food issue. We have to look in a very different way. You cannot measure it as say that uh, one liter of water is available on a, uh, in a going in a canal. It's not as simple. It's a very difficult science. Science is so difficult, so we need to go for the aquifers. I mean, we need to understand what aquifers are storing, how the aquifers are behaving, how is the uh, capacity of these aquifers to store these water. So we are undertaking this activity. Not many work which we have already undertaken. So uh, I like just like to give an example that in the, the good aquifers or the soil which contains water in the not, I mean the, in the indo basin is around 10% uh, of the total volume, and in 
say, uh, a certain part of the country in uh, Maharashtra, uh, in the Kenvesar, in Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Andhra, all these places, it's hardly 1% to 2% of the total volume. So you can just imagine that how many fold volume is water is lesser available in these parts of the country, and it does not go. It is the nature. It is a, and we cannot fight with that. Whatsoever we are given or we are, I mean, this country is there, wherever we have water, so we need to deploy or devise the ways and means to address the issue at the local level or at the uh, uh, small level, like uh, uh, the previous speaker has talked about Aurangabad, and it was a very big success story. So now, uh, I mean, given to the, uh, with the, the climate change, uh, the extreme events becoming very regular, uh, the lesser quantity of water coming, uh, like uh, the water which, or the rain water which uh, comes with the lesser intensity, the water going to the rain, into the, the problem is going to get manifold because we need a different type of storage or the conservation also I will talk about. Uh, what I can, I mean, uh, look at that, uh, how the corporates uh, we can chip in. We are probably, we need to look at the ways and means where the irrigation technologies uh, uh, they can be improved for better water use efficiency. Uh, sprinkle can be improved. We need to uh, look at the RO systems. Let's have the, I mean, with minimum irrigants, uh, the RO system, or we somehow other we recycle or reuse uh, this, which is there. We need to, uh, I mean, devise as many as ways, wherever the water is being consumed in any industry, let's come with the zero risk of water consumption side, both ways. And probably, you know, uh, we can have, but all these efforts, you know, they, they cannot, we cannot handle these efforts at individual levels. Because the water is a common pool resource, it's all be, uh, below you uh, in our aquifers, in the groundwater, especially. We can, we need to have probably uh, some water conservation bodies in each of the industrial clusters of the area. So that is probably need of our, and they need to address whole of that area, not individual, obviously individual need to chip in afterwards, but on a uh, uh, collective and a higher level it can be uh, undertaken, uh, obviously we need to improve on this. So we need to obviously replenish groundwater because the country, once again, I said that the, if we stay, store it on the surface, the large quantity of gets evaporated, goes back to the atmosphere, we cannot afford it, or if it is getting lost because of the potential evapotranspiration through the uh, uh, plants which are grown, grown uh, nearby, we probably cannot commit enough. Uh, we need to handle it very uh, carefully. And you know, why not, uh, given the current set of situations, circumstances, and the mindsets and the brilliant uh, uh, human resource available within the country, I think we can surely become world leaders. If we can become a world leader in uh, COVID vaccination, why can't we do it? Also, let's take this study. Thank you once again. Thank you very much, Mr. Malwaha. And, uh, you have really uh, given us uh, your perspective on not just the value of water, but uh, also how corporates can engage in sustainable man uh, management of water, including in groundwater recharge efforts. So thank you very much uh, for your uh, for joining us here uh, in, in the One Water Day event by FIKI. And now we'll move on to the panel discussion. But before we do that, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Nestle, which is our sponsor for the World Water Day webinar. Uh, we now move on to the panel discussion, which will be led by Ms. Sangeeta Thakral, uh, who is the Head of Sustainability uh, and CSR in Diageo India, uh, with more than 17 years of multi-sectoral and multi-dimensional global experience in communication, CSR, and sustainability. And on the panel, we have a great mix of a solutions provider company, of uh, an end user company, and an NGO. So we have Mr. Raghav Trivedi, who's currently the business head of the thermal part of Semcorp Energy India Limited. So we'll hear a perspective from the power sector. 
Uh, we also have Mr. Sunil Nanda, who's the managing director, JS Water Energy Life, which is a solutions provider. And Mr. Nanda himself, Commodore Sunil Nanda, uh, has served in the Indian Navy for more than 20 years and has turned into a successful entrepreneur. And then we have Manoj Gulanti, who's the managing director of water.org. Uh, he champions water.org's strategy, vision, uh, and water and sanitation program expansion in India and is responsible for scaling strategic partnerships that increase access to financing for water and sanitation. So with that, uh, I'll now hand over the panel discussion to Sangeeta Thakral. Thanks, Rita. Thank you very much. And uh, as uh, the chair, uh, co-chair, and everyone has uh, wished you all uh, of a very happy wall, uh, World Water Day, and I'm, I'm reiterating this, because it's a day to educate, celebrate, reflect, uh, with an intention to make a difference to water management in the world. And I must thank Fiki uh, Water Mission for putting together a wonderful panel to deliberate on this pertinent topic. Um, our discussion today uh, revolves around corporate uh, water stewardship, uh, making it a priority for business. And to go deeper on this theme, we have identified three areas for our discussion, which is about uh, uh, groundwater management and how corporates are focusing beyond the fence and also how the ecosystem players such as NGO and the solution provider that we have are, are actually contributing or supporting to this agenda. Next, we would also delve into the topic of uh, uh, you know, uh, solutions that corporate are um, implementing on community ownership and behavior change in water. Uh, and, and then last but not the least, because today is World Water Day and the theme is about valuing water, we would also uh, you know, uh, find out or reflect on the theme of the day. As Rita has said that we have a very, uh, and she has introduced already a very power packed panel for uh, today representing the ecosystem of support. I would like to begin with uh, by asking each panelist to share uh, in five to seven minutes their work around water or, or highlight important milestone of their organization uh, in the water journey. And let me first go to Raghav, uh, you know, uh, Raghav, if you can share about your water journey. Good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, am I audible properly? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Yeah. It's uh, now first checklist for Zoom calls. So <laughs> we are learning new ways. Completely agree. So, <clears throat> thanks. <laughs> thanks. Thanks very much for inviting me this morning. Uh, I came to know, and I was so happy hearing so, uh, from experts about the water. And I've been in this industry for I mean, 40 years. And if you see the list of industries who consume maximum water, thermal power plant comes at the top. So, uh, a bad man in that sense. What he is doing this, but you know, energy is required. So, shift is happening in Semcop, but we are a Singapore based company. And uh, uh, we, we are very conscious about the water. As you know, Singapore as a country is also very, very conscious about the water. Uh, in Singapore, we do uh, about one third of the Singapore uh, need of water in a treatment or supply. We do wastewater treatment, ETP treatment. And we have presence in uh, uh, more than five countries doing the water treatment and recycling it. We have expertise in that. Uh, in uh, India, we have renewable power, and uh, I had the thermal one. Uh, and so, you know, thermal uh, here. Uh, one a small thing I want to add that um, the SimCorp uh, chose to have power plants at the coast where they, we use seawater. We don't use the salt water. So in fact, whatever comes out of after evaporation is being used for green belt. And so it goes to that. Plant. That's, a, that's a, a small introduction about it. And you know, coming to the World Water Day, I'm very happy that uh, I'm a part of such an elite group and very, non very knowledgeable group. Uh, what reminds me of in, in every uh, 
your journey in the industry. And I've been always in industry, uh, working inside the industry. Whatever you design in the name of CSA, water becomes the focus. Water, if you want to give drinking water anyhow, without saying it. If you want to see education, again, you go to the schools and see the dropouts and you provide the drinking good water and you can see the dropouts coming. Health, of course, water is there and good water and bad water if you can teach people. That makes a big difference. So we again do the studies that what are the diseases and how you can uh, uh, control them just by giving them some tips of how to uh, handle the water, how to make difference between good water and the bad water, what is drinkable, what is not drinkable. And one thing I would like to add in my journey, and later we can add more on this uh, as I will be trying to give examples. We in industry, especially power plants, have our own reservoirs, which use the soft water, river water. And at times you have a, say, barrage. Uh, you might have collected water during the rainy seasons. But imagine a situation where you have a water inside your plant and you have a water in the garage, but the villages don't have water. Their ponds have dried up. You can't work there. From same villages, your workers are coming. You go to their small shops also. You can't work like this. And I face this situation. They said, no, sir, how, how it can be? You have water. We will get out you. We will not allow you to work. I don't have a drinking water, sir. We have to find solution. We have to find lasting solution. You have to recharge their ponds. You have to work with them. And it's you are not doing any good to them. It's doing for yourself, for the industry. And this is what I have learned, working at the field. That by, by doing CSR, you are not going any, any charity to them. No favor to them. It's for your own benefit. So, so uh, thanks a lot for calling me. We will take this discussion further. Uh, I'll not be able to tell too much data. I am not expert in that. But I know one very simple thing. In our Hindu religion or the mythology, the king of God is Indra. So right when there were a lot of water, still people were very clear the importance of that. And Indra stands for the rain symbol. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, Raghav, for sharing your intention and the organizations, which I must uh, mention that it is in the right direction and it is the positive in the intention. Now, I would like to move on to Sunil. Sunil, if you may share your highlights from your organization's water journey. You're on mute, Sunil. Yeah. Thank you, Sangeeta. Thank you, Rita, Vicky. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So we are based here in Gurgaon and uh, we've developed a, a product at uh, nanoscale, which can, which can improve wastewater water quality. And uh, I see that, you know, we're talking here about groundwater, but groundwater and surface water are interlinked. Each one mixes with the other. And if surface water is polluted, obviously the groundwater would be polluted. And therefore we have these statistics in India, about 386 districts out of uh, 718 districts uh, have uh, nitrogen pollution in groundwater. 300 plus in fluoride, arsenic, and the list goes on. So unless we get hold of our surface water quality, our groundwater quality is not going to improve. And therefore, how do you improve your surface water quality? That's the challenge before us. So there is something called STPs and sewage treatment plants to tap uh, wastewater, treat them, and release it into the drains or rivers. That is one way. But there are serious limitations of STPs. And uh, that's why, you know, 
despite so many STPs about 1,095 in India, we still feel or we still see that our rivers are ever more polluted than they were. So these STPs have limitations. And the limitations are they can't do nutrient recycling. They generate a lot of sludge. And therefore, uh, the organic waste decomposition does not keep in pace with the amount of waste coming in. So what are the other options then? So we work around those other options and we call it bioremediation or in our uh, you know, specific language, we call it phycoremediation. Phycoremediation is use of algae to clean up water. And um, <clears throat> we see that uh, this practice um, overcomes the, sh the shortcomings of the STPs. So like in a country in Malaysia, almost every river, uh, the raw water has to go through a bioremediation process before it goes to STPs. So the task of STPs becomes easier. And before it hits the STPs, the water is pretty much within the acceptable range. So we work in this area. And I was telling you about a river we're doing in Malaysia. Uh, we turned that river around. It had you know, oil pollution, it had chemical pollution, uh, of course, fertilizer runoff, pesticide runoff. And in three months, mm, we pretty much uh, turned the river. It can be used for irrigation. So imagine the amount of water that is now available to the government to do this, to, to provide to irrigation. So mm, I'm trying to come to a point, uh, you know, also that um, most, of our, most of us corporates work around, you know, uh, our CSR is around, um, let's say, drinking water or availability of water, but not much goes to water quality. So I would, you know, looking at the future, uh, you know, just advocate both to the government and to the corporate that we should look at water quality and especially surface water quality. When I say surface water quality, I mean rivers, lakes, wetlands, urban ponds, rural ponds, everything. And uh, the other thing is that we in India measure our water quality in a very narrow perspective. We look at some chemical parameters, BOD, COD, you know, dissolved oxygen. But uh, like in US, uh, if you go to EPA, they'll measure the water quality you know, of a river uh, as also a bio, bio integrity index. So ultimately, you know, all these organisms are the ones who will do nutrient recycling. So if that part is not healthy, you obviously your river health cannot be achieved. So I would strongly advocate that we look at other measures of water quality for our rivers. You know, as a small, as a SME, we've adopted this Radesham Kund uh, for water quality in Govardhan. So we did six months of work, it stopped in between, we're picking up again, and uh, we've tied up with a local NGO to do this. And, uh, you know, so lakhs of devotees come there, including many, many foreign devotees, you would know, all know. And uh, they were unable to touch the water. It had come to a level about three years back where they couldn't even uh, put their hand in the water. So there's no engagement with the water. We're happy to say that we've brought, uh, you know, we improved that water condition and now people can even have a bath in it. And, you know, I would urge the corporates to as part of this program to adopt urban water bodies, which are very stressed and, uh, you know, improve the groundwater thereby. 
that's all I have to share. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sunil. I think uh, uh, as you very rightly uh, highlighted the role of an NGO partner. So here I'm going to talk to Manoj and ask him to share uh, some of his uh, you know, uh, highlights of what dot org's uh, experience and journey so far. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Sangeeta, and uh, wish everyone a very happy uh, World Water Day. Uh, am I audible well, or do I need to do any adjustments? Uh, Sangeeta, You're audible, okay? yeah. Perfect. So, uh, water.org, as you know, we are part and uh, we are advisors to the uh, Water Resilience Coalition. We are members of and um, uh, part of the ISC, the India Sanitation Coalition. And for us, the key focus that has been over the last few years has been to be bringing in uh, capital mobilization for water and sanitation. Specifically today, given that we are with Fiki, and thank you so much, uh, the focus on industry is very important. And traditionally, when we have seen it, we have found that the our traditional mindset was water was looked more as a compliance issue, or it was looked as an issue that if you want to start a new project, then you, if you need a, an NOC, then I must have some water sanitation. Very short-term perspective to the way business was done. Or you know, even to avoid a penalty you may be given if you have not done your wastewater treatment. However, what you know, one thing which COVID and very recent, as COVID came in, it gave a much broader and loud, loud, bigger perspective to what is the impact of water. So, you know, Nena talked about it earlier and the issue that water traditionally is considered as your first level of resilience, your first arm of protection. Well, what would you do to do, and you know, many of us, I would say all, almost all of us, we wash our hands, you know, eight, 10, 15 times a day. What do you do when you have to walk four kilometers, three kilometers every day to get one bucket of water? That's when you, all this goes. The water happens is further, you're not able to wash enough and COVID stays. And you go a little deeper, what does that do to your economy? What does it do to your entire last year, how we had to struggle through? For bankers, what does it do to your NPA as you get hit with more and more COVID? I'll give another example, uh, Maharashtra, which is again, we are seeing a lot of uh, resilience of, uh, of uh, COVID coming back. 100,000 community toilets are there. It's the largest community toilets in the country are in Maharashtra. These toilets, as you would imagine, many of them are not well maintained and water and behavioral change are ingredients for managing good community toilets. Again, another case, the uh, community toilets are creating more and more without water, they're of no use. My own journey within uh, water.org started five years back when I found that the impact of having uh, alternative financing and affordable financing could really solve the people of a lot of people who actually are living at the base of the economic pyramid. But what they're really looking for is just a small short-term loan to solve the problem. What they're not looking for is grants or in charity because that really doesn't solve the problem. What we found is that over this period of time, people actually started to, know, initially they were taking just a water loan or a sanitation toilet construction loan, but over a period of time, they have started to take loans for a toilet, uh, uh, toilet and bathroom. They started to take a loan for roof rainwater harvesting at their own, at their households or for water storage. So even as, the Jal Shakti and the FHTC, the functional household tap connection is happening. You do need to have a backup to have a storage tank for your own. And for this, you do need to have a, a, a take a small loan and avail it on your own, because that's not what the government is going to give. So I'm happy to inform that over this last, from 2008, when Water.org came to India, we've done over 31 lakh loans. We've mo mobilized through our financial partners over 4,000 crores. This is where the people have actually started to take an Atma Nirbhar approach to the water, where they've said, we can solve this own problem and we can be more healthy and more productive in our lives. So that's the, the general play that we have been happy to get into more deeper discussions as we go get along. Thank you. Thanks, Manoj. And I think you've touched upon very, very pertinent uh, 
theme, which is uh, around COVID and, and the use of water, and also about the financing aspect that you talked about. We'll definitely, during our course of conversation, we'll, we'll take a, you know, we'll delve into those. Uh, but it's really wonderful to know how each one of you are lending relevant support to this important cause of water. Now, uh, coming to our theme of groundwater management, um, as, as a water practitioner and what you have also observed, Manoj and others, I can also confidently say that in the last seven years, the significance of water as a strategic CSR activity has grown. Uh, which can be seen by the increased funding in water and sanitation. And of all intervention, water and allied activities, um, you know, groundwater has been one of the most conventional yet important intervention for water replenishment. And, uh, uh, you know, in the recent years, uh, we've seen corporates actively working on groundwater replenishment as part of their larger water stewardship uh, strategy. Uh, and, and we all know that groundwater mainly possesses two key challenges, and you all have highlighted on access and quality. And uh, as per Niti Aayog's uh, Composite Water Management Index, 40% of India's population will not have access to drinking water by 2030. And 70% uh, of uh, uh, water resources are contaminated. And, and Sunil also mentioned like out of 300, uh, out of 700, 356 district reported critical or over uh, exploited groundwater levels. And, and Raghav also said the water usage by industry, which is around 35%. Now, uh, my question to the panel is, and I would like to go to Raghav again. And if Raghav would like to share some initiative or, or visible impact that, uh, that you as an organization see in the communities where you are working around groundwater uh, management. And also, uh, if you may share some good practices that set your organization up for success when it comes to groundwater management. Uh, Raghav, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, one thing I would like to tell that uh, nowadays, all the new, new modern factories, their design itself uh, calls for uh, groundwater charging. So uh, all the, including our power plants. So if you want to get it cleared, you have to show very scientific way how the water harvesting is being done and how, how scientifically you are doing it. So it's a, it's a good, good initiative uh, that way and it is mandatory. So that, that's one thing. But to be honest, if you see on the community service part and that what I talk about the villages around, the first need is the drinking water. And I, I, will, I have not seen, I should, I should be very honest, that a very, uh, I can see much effort being done there. So they are linked. If they have a good groundwater charge, they will get water. But I think uh, uh, where all the, all the focus is, is on the drinking water, because that's the first thing they would like to, to see. And, uh, of course, in the CSR, uh, one thing I forgot to tell in the first part, when I said the education is linked and other thing is linked. Didika um, and Mr. Galati gave a very good example that uh, you can imagine a lady carrying the, the pitcher on the head and what happens if you have to walk five kilometers? What is important to imagine is when we talk about somebody taking, going and taking water from five kilometers, whose image comes in mind? A lady, never a man. So that is also a big issue with the gender. Whenever there is a water crisis, it is the ladies who come to their stress first. And this is what I have realized every time you give water management, to these ladies, they do it far, far better. We in our setup have about 11 uh, RO plants in the villages, 45,000 families are being given. It was a chaos earlier. Somebody will pay for it, somebody will not pay for it. It's a very notional charge we take because you should not waste it. But then if you give to ladies, they will, uh, they will come with a very proper management of it. So that's one point I wanted to cover from this. Uh, I, I would say that uh, we should have a very clear uh, 
vision statement or with the technology provider, with the government, how we want to have a proper system of groundwater charging and do not get it contaminated. Even see at the ground level, it is very difficult to explain people that in your own pond, your buffaloes cannot be together, you cannot wash it together, you cannot drink also from the same thing. This is where we are. It's a common sight. You go to any rural say, village, you see these three things coexisting. Their so buffaloes are there, they're washing clothes, so they are drinking water, they are taking bath, everything. So this, I think a lot, lot has to be done on that. And from a corporate perspective, definitely we all would like to do it. For, first of all, uh, remember that corporate main focus is for their own industry. It's not that they, they do not want to do it, but their expertise is there. Their focus is in their industry. So if the guidelines are very clear, they would like to participate can work and they do work. Second point I want to make in this sustainability, I've seen many RU plants being made, constructed to run for three, four months and then nobody's there. I, where I work here in the Andhra Pradesh, near the KP port, same I have seen. Then we decided that, no, that's not right. We ourselves will maintain it. We are technical people. Why can't we do that? So we took it over. So again, I'm saying that CSR, when it is opposed to corporate, many a times, it is like a one-time fund. Can you construct this? Can you do this? Can you do this from this 2%? But if they are not given a responsibility to run it, then you all know, we all know what happens to it. Again, I'm trying to add one more thing to it on the corporate perspective. It is 2% of their profit. What happens after? they cease to get profits. What happens to those long-term programs? Then the same thing happens. So we need to have a, some kind of pool also being formed so that the sustainability continues. Thanks, thanks, I think I'll join again. Yeah, uh, thanks, Raghav. I think uh, the the aspect of sustainability that you've highlighted is very important, and also for drawing attention towards the fact that what happened if the two percent is not there and how we will ensure. I think these are some of the things which we really need to deliberate on. And as um, Nena said right at the beginning, we have uh, this year we have uh, again reconstituted the uh, you know water uh, stewardship working group. And I think these are very, very important uh, topics to take back to the working group and, and deliberate on. But uh, on today's panel, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. Uh, coming back to uh, you, Sunil, as a solution provider, uh, you have been supporting companies on addressing water access. And you've also mentioned about you know, quality. Uh, as for you, what can companies do to increase the impact and, and build reliable solutions quality and availability of groundwater. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I think this has been discussed in the forum somewhat with uh, by Raghav also, that uh, we need to take, uh, companies need to take a long-term position on maintaining some of the surface water, water bodies. Um, right now, as he says, you know, the companies would uh, fund initial capital costs, but then uh, what about the maintenance? That is one area. Another area very, uh, which I would like to highlight is that there's a diffused responsibility all over in India. Uh, I see it in the corporate sector too. Mm, but in many countries uh, that we see, uh, they nominate a person by name. Uh, Mr. Nanda is going to look after River Yamuna, Delhi segment, or full thing. So there is no diffused accountability. If something goes wrong, uh, Mr. Nanda is behind bars. So there has to be a, uh, an organization built in as a culture mm, within the corporates, outside the corporates of uh, you know, 
making a nodal person as a single point authority uh, for the health of a river or a water body. I think that's what I would like to advise at this juncture. Thank you, Sunil. Thanks, Sunil. Uh, Manoj, uh, from water.org, I think it will be good to know what some of the lessons uh, that you've learned over the years on engaging with corporates uh, over water conservation programs. Yeah, thanks again, Sunita. Uh, you know, what I've, we have learned over a period of time is that water conservation programs run well when there is uh, the organization, the corporates take a much broader perspective to the problem. When they are able to look at it beyond just the immediate around the plant scenario. And I'll give you examples, for instance, we work very closely with Microsoft. Now, Microsoft has got a position where they're saying we want to work in multiple states in addressing their water conservation issues. We want to look at the water basin issues. They've got nothing which is they know that at the end of the day, it's not directly working. You know, it's, it's a much broader perspective that they have gained, that they apply in their day-to-day -day lives. We, I'll give you another example. Uh, and we've talked about the, you know, the uh, Prime Minister uh, on, uh, FHTC program, which has come through and now Catch the Rain program. Corporates need to look at programs which can actually not replicate the same thing, but complement the programs that the governments are taking. Those, and they should find ways by which it can catalyze the government programs further. Because that's when it really gets the bang for the money completely. Otherwise it ends up just becoming, you wanted CSR funds, I gave you the CSR funds. So adopting the, the, the perspective and applying it is much more important. I'll give you an example. We are Currently, and much has been talked about, Raghav talked about it. We've also seen the, you know, the uh, community uh, power, uh, water uh, plants. Now, the traditional mindset was that, okay, we need to bring in a CapEx and we need to solve it. But the, the, the organization needs to look at it from how can I make it more efficient right at the beginning, whether it is not just the CapEx, not just the O&M, but what are the behavioral change issues that we need to bring along with it? So when you bring in the deepest layer is people need to adopt it. And how are we doing it? I find that, you know, corporates need to look at it from the community from in, in India where the self-help groups are so strong. They need to, the more we can educate for the long run, the, uh, the self-help, the women in the self-help groups, the longer the sustenance of the solution would be the better would be the adaptation of it. So it's important that the, the corporates shift their perspective to 2% or CapEx and to take a much broader perspective. And lastly, I think it's very important that when we are taking these uh, projects up, we are also involving the local community into it. Because that's when the real issues start getting addressed. Uh, again, the earlier example that without solving their water problem, you cannot have your, your plant running. And so if you have taken that perspective, it really then gets integrated to their solution and your solution. Thanks. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks Manoj. Manoj, I would also like to come back to you uh, with one more question. And, mm -hmm. and, and what you have said right now is very, very pertinent that companies need to go beyond uh, their fence and need to invest more in communi uh, communities also the 2%. Now, uh, since you've been working with uh, corporates and you've mentioned Microsoft, talking about the theme, which is groundwater especially, what impact, you know, uh, I mean, in, in order to increase the impact and build reliable solutions for quality and, and, and availability of uh, uh, groundwater, what do you think companies can do? One or two things, especially around groundwater that you have probably worked with. Correct. I mean, water conservation is in. Uh, it can be looked at it from multiple ways. The you know, I have, I have another partner with whom we are working uh, very closely, and they are looking into conservation of water through real focus on roof rainwater harvesting, which is actually conservation right there happening. 
what they've also looked into this issue is to say that when this water, when how new houses are being constructed, right at that time, there's a lot of yojanas that are now for, you know, for uh, house construction. There's a lot of financial institutions that are into the housing loan business. What they are helping, what we are helping is to bring in water conservation right in the, at the stage of construct. Where another one, which is often, you know, you'll talk about water conservation. It is, again, going back to Microsoft, where they are saying we'll do extensive mason training and plumber training. Because there's a lot of water wastage that happens. If I remember, it, it's something like globally 7 trillion gallons or uh, liters of water is lost. And that is what, if you can, you can capture that water, you've actually been able to conserve that water for your usage. So there are projects that are available, which you can adopt very easily in what you do. And finally, I'll give an example of GAP, another uh, very strong committed uh, partner where they have established a women water alliance. And in that alliance, what they're helping you do is look at all the river basins and say, what solutions are required at the ground level, which can actually then create enough water, which is there, and then accessibility to the, to the people. So these two things, which have, you know, people look at projects in, and a point being, they look at only one part of the project and not at the holistic view, the entire ecosystem. When they start adopting an entire ecosystem solution, that's when the quality of the water, the accessibility of the water, and the affordability of water can be met, can be reached about. So it's very important for corporates to take start looking how are they contributing in the big picture. Thanks, Banuj. That's really helpful, and and I will probably move on to the next uh, you know area that we would like to discuss. And we have been talking about, and some of you have also highlighted that in times of COVID, it is extremely important. Not that it was not important earlier, but it, the the point that COVID has made around behavior change and uh, use of water is, I think. Uh, you know, a lot of attention has been drawn towards that. So I, I would like to go back to Raghav and I would like to, you know, understand from the corporate side of, of behavior change management and, and uh, water program, what are some of the challenges and opportunities available uh, for corporates, Raghav, in undertaking community-driven behavior change water initiative and to scale those, if you may share your views. Yeah, well, uh, of course, uh, every corporate has its own challenges, depending on where they are, where their business is. Uh, corporate with uh, large uh, funds can have a very different perspective, and corporate with uh, smaller fund will like to have a more impact program with the lesser fee. So, cannot generalize and cannot represent everyone. Uh, 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 but I would say that uh, uh, COVID time included it became a bigger challenge because you need to get a raw material, you get to have a, a filters in place and all that. So you have to, uh, since we were uh, industries which was classified as essential services, so we could get uh, the raw material for the our water plants also. Um, uh, see the water will remain water, whether there's a COVID or no COVID. And in fact, I will tell you that uh, there was a time uh, when the operators will not come to operate because it is a COVID time, so I'm not going to die. You know, four or five months were like that. People were totally confused. I know because we were running the power plant during that time. I, operators will come and say, sir, I also have a family. So those were very difficult times. And, uh, and uh, then uh, you have to give examples and what kind of examples? You yourself don't know what, what this, uh, this disease is. Uh, uh, now, having said that, our, if I talk about the challenges broadly and that gets applicable on the water drive also, I can talk about certain challenges. So one, of course, is the sustainability I talk. And uh, very rightly said that we should complement it. But very often what we are asked that you provide to the funds. If there is a fund available with these guys, give the fund. So here you do not have a choice for complementing. 
you come and say, no, sir, this is okay, but infrastructure is not the only thing we would like to, but normally you are expected to do these things in most of the forums I have seen. I, I very often go myself. Uh, second point is, which is a harsh reality, which I should mention. Otherwise we will not be talking uh, uh, the, the real thing is there is a lot of interference in distribution of CSR funds for most of the industries. Some political interference comes, some contracting interference comes, some priorities. Sometimes people have a right priority. I don't say they're wrong, but they, they're, their goals are different. So even if with a limited fund, not with a vast fund, you can do all the things together. But consider that most of the industries have a limited fund. If they like, they can stretch beyond two, but even if it is stretched within two, which a fairly good amount put together, they, they lose the choice very often. And here comes the issue of sustainability. You do the road, you give him the contract, we, this is my constituency, all, 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 all that. You know what I'm talking about. So in that whole path, very often these sustainability things just be lost. But I, but having said that, uh, the, all the companies who show the firm, firm direction and what is being said is a long-term direction. Nobody can deviate them. There's a slight adjustment they can do here and there. And, and everybody listens to, to, to them. Ultimately, because if the people say, this is good for me, Everybody else will start saying also, please don't compromise on that. So we try to put pressure from the people. If I'm asked to divert the funds somewhere else under the, the name of CSR. So uh, uh, this is what I have to share. I mean, definitely uh, water is, uh, I said not in the front, but whatever you do, water comes, as I said, whether gender or dropouts or everywhere it comes. So maybe we have to have a, more focused policy. I would be happy if area-wise, zone-wise, what is the requirement of water? And uh, a guideline is issued that you can allocate this much percentage. I think then, then it will be easy for everyone to have the right direction and the common focus on that. Yeah. Thanks. Thank, thanks, Raghav. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Nanda had to drop out because of another meeting, but we will continue this conversation. And uh, uh, coming back to behavior change, uh, Manoj, this is a very critical aspect of water management. And most of corporates are talking about NGOs. We, we struggle there when it comes to behavioral change. And it's not about a responsibility of one entity to ensure that you know, uh, the behavior change that we are, we are expecting as an outcome will happen. How would the ideal uh, you know, partnership between corporate and NGOs or the communities look like to you when it comes to behavior change and how that should be driven for the kind of impact or the outcome that we would like to see on the ground? A great one. Um, I think uh, Raghavji gave a, you know, a very good representation of what the ground reality is. When you actually want to do good and you're blocked by multiple forces. But he also gave a little bit of an insight to where the solution lies. And that was the, the catching point, which I immediately said, yes, he's got the solution also with, his, uh, with the pain. I find behavioral change is, is a very difficult topic, uh, especially where, uh, if you can imagine, uh, where we are saying that the uh, financing is the alternative financing is the way to move forward for ODF. Now, if you look at, uh, you know, ODF, which happened, the open defecation free, SBM happened. What happened is that the planning was not enough for SBM2, which is basically sustainability models had not been established. There was a mindset like this, we have to achieve 110 million uh, toilets to be, con uh, to be constructed. And that's all that mattered. Sustainability, you go, it's later conversation. What we have to do at this stage with respect to water, whether it is establishment of you know, water conservation or water accessibility or a purification plant, we have to take 
the long term people into understanding what will make it sustainable for them until that they and that doesn't take it's not the investment it is the the corporate can actually align with the ngos in small in a small way but bring an a, amazing impact with respect to capacity development and behavior change if in effect what i'm saying is if you want to take your uh, adopt a program involve the people if the people's voices are alive it's much easier to take the project further if you're doing it just out of your interest to do a check in the box for that i have spent it then there is no people involvement and you will lose at some stage to other forces so that is one major thing which comes for behavioral change when we have found that when we ask people to take a loan the general you know there's always the mindset by everyone that this is government's responsibility but when you talk about the economic and the health benefits that they would get out of it the women who would get the safety or they would get the access and save the time it changes their perspective to what they want luckily that over the last few years the government has also we've been able to get thanks to isc and organizations like sadhan we've been able to get uh, water and sanitation at the priority sector lending which makes it a lot more easier today to look at alternative financing which can be built there's a lot to be done but at least the the, me the mechanics of it the optics of that has been established what we need to do whenever this we do this kind of a work with the women we find that they have, the biggest question is behavioral change comes when their awareness is there that we can take things on our own we don't need to depend on someone and the level of ownership and pride comes in at that stage so i think a lot of focus comes is how you corporates can work with ngos or corporates can work with uh, stakeholders local stakeholders who can truly influence the system over there i hope that answers it. thanks thanks uh, manoj i think that has really been very nicely elucidated by you now moving on to the uh, you know third agenda point that we have uh, uh, for today's discussion which was about valuing water which is the theme of the day i would like to go to radha and and you know i would like to understand how has the thought process around water as a resource evolved in your organization in the last 10 years well if i give you example of um, uh the industry i come from thermal power plants which which consume huge water in fact they 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 evaporate it and uh, very often i see uh, news that these are polluting industry and they show my cooling towers which are evaporating water they, that's not a polluting part of it so but but say anyway a large amount is being say, evaporated so and uh, industries everywhere where you use the soft water which is somewhat cheaper but the way the we use sea water it itself is very expensive very very expensive because sea water you convert it to ultimately demineralized water in different stages potable water service water fire water and the demineralized water and every step it becomes very expensive so i know most of the very responsible um, uh, power plant operators and that happened that, and and also that's common for many industries uh, because uh, i have been uh, talking to many industries uh, since i was a part of a power distribution also they have a, a water management system typically a power plant thermal power plant are zero discharge so they will recycle it and is used for maybe green belt we have about 30% area covered with the green belt but then also uh, like we do in chemcorp every tapping we have a meter every specific use i have a, i have a water meter so i know a weekly consumption pattern you can't have a leaking pipeline leaking french you will come to know immediately i wish that we could have done it in a more sophisticated way having this online data 
uh, which we do for the other uh, say audits. But still, we have got meters everywhere. So it's a, like simple saying, if you can uh, uh, evaluate it, if you can quantify it, you can monitor it. If you cannot quantify, you cannot monitor it. That's a very simple law. Anything. So first thing is to quantify. A similar thing we started doing when we started engaging with these villages. You quantify how much water was generated. What was the money? It's a very cheap, maybe I think two rupees for 20 liters or something. And I said that some people were not willing to give. So I said, okay, whatever comes, I will give again back to Panchayat. You tell me where to spend under the CSR head so that you value water. Once you put a price tag, they start valuing it. Also, uh, we had, I mean, peculiar problems. Uh, I found that uh, some of my Aru, these drinking water plants will always go bad, at least six, seven days a month. And then I would later get a bill from the tankers. So you can find out then there is a mafia working there. So ground levels are very, very different. But one thing I know that if you are with the villages, they understand. The users understand, but today the villages are not as simple as we, we know it before. It's a lot of politics, a lot of people who want to take advantage of every scheme, a few handful of people. You have to penetrate and go down who are the actual, so empower them. Then you will get the real value of whatever you are doing in Huli. So uh, I, I'm no expert of any other way of uh, describing water, but this is what my experience is. No, that, that's really uh, you know nice to hear, uh, Raghav, and also what you've said, quantifying water, putting a price to water for making sure that it is valued. I think some of those are also equally important to know. Uh, but uh, Manoj, from your vantage point, I would like to understand if, if you can share some opportunities for corporates to get better uh, in order to effectively contribute towards water conservation especially groundwater? Uh, you know, uh, I just want to step for a minute and see what is valuing water. It's such a big theme that has come in such a, at such an important time that it has come through. You know, the basic is if, if I you know, just use the anecdote, you know, the value is in the eyes of the person who sees it. And for, for one person, the value of water, the woman who walks, you know, and on average in India, uh, she walks or her daughter, either she or her daughter walks two hours a day. The average trip is 30 minutes and four trips a day she takes. That's the productive loss. That's the loss of education. So for her, the value of water is tremendous. The value of that every two minutes, somebody, a child loses a dies every two minutes in the world because of waterborne diseases, that value is tremendous, getting the right water. But if you look at the wastewater that is created and the amount of water that is wasted, it looks like there is no value for the water or there is a negative value for the water, even to that extent. So in this situation, how do you create continued impact with the people in getting, especially with respect to the groundwater, how do you bring that message to people? I think what we have found over a period of time is we work, and you know, there's a project that we are currently doing with another organization, Water Aid. And so, what we started to look at is financial players can play the financial supply of the issues. The blending of it can come from the CSR and the government contribution. So, you can have blended finance concepts. But unless we do not invest, in the demand creation of whatever be the product, the solution will not come. You want water conservation, you have to approach it. You have to educate the people that there is. And you know, it's very interesting when you see that when people realize, and this happened in Odisha and in Jharkhand, and uh, um, when people realize that the average cost of uh, doing a bore well construction is 151 lakh 50,000. And they could not afford it at their level. They found solutions by 
doing a community bore well for themselves with single pipe going to 300 feet down and connectivity to their individual household, not a, uh, that they had a stand post, but individual household connectivities with a meter paying the electricity and one rupee of contribution per day for ONM. So that's the kind of a thing where if you educate them, they understand the importance of groundwater, what it does. And that's where we have to try to emphasize the more we build the right capacity with the local NGOs, with the local administration, the longer, the faster we will solve the issues uh, to work from. Finally, I would say that all corporates, you know, you know, different corporates have got different because of the size and the structure of the organization, because of the type of business they're doing, either they will be hitting the availability issues are important to them, or the quality issues will become important to them, or the accessibility issues will become important. What we need to work with corporates is to make them assess and figure out best which of those parameters is really the key factor for them. And that is also a key factor at their locations that they want to serve. And when we serve, when we when we match the two, we really start finding solutions. Thank you. Thanks. So since we have uh, Sunil back on the call, so I would probably like to go back to Sunil again and check or uh, ask for his reflection on the theme, which is valuing water as a as a water solution provider. Yes, yeah, Sangeeta. Mm, thanks. Sorry, I had to go somewhere, left the meeting. No yeah. Um, yeah, I think we have uh, come a long way uh, since, uh, in the, especially in the last uh, few years. And uh, corporates are most um, sensitive to water and water quality. And uh, we're seeing the change ourselves in the field. And I think. Uh, with uh, advocacy from FICI and other platforms, I think uh, more and more corporates will be on board soon. Um, it's it's a it's a it's a hard challenge to get uh, water quality up, but uh, it can be done. Um, as we always say in our uh, industry, uh, that uh, there are three pillars to to uh, you know getting good water. Of course, technology, uh, enforcement, and standards. Uh, I think uh, where we were lacking the norm uh, was the technology. What happens is that uh, when uh, uh, enforcement is weak, uh, the burden comes on the technology, really, to get the water up. And um, Technology has been upgrading in India. I see technologies elsewhere in the world, um, US, Australia, Singapore. And I see that uh, our technologies are not lagging far behind. And uh, I'm very hopeful that uh, some of the hard problems around water would be solved in the next, uh, let's say, five years or so. Thank you, Sangeeta. Thanks, Sunil. So as we come to the uh, tag end of this uh, deliberation, uh, and, and since today's World Water Day, and Raghav has also briefly mentioned about this, I would like to ask each one of you, what is your vision for the change you'd like to see in the coming decade on, on let's say, World Water Day 2030? What is that you would like to see by then? So I, I'll probably go back to Raghav again. Well, if you ask me, I feel very pained when we talk about uh, our villages, our people, we are talking about educating them, water, all that. They also have a right to open the tap and drink from there. Even we cannot drink from there. But my vision is, first of all, I don't want to see any difference between uh, the, the urban population and the villages. Why we treat them like that? They also have a right. And I'm sure the way uh, uh, our uh, rural uh, people are coming up, their children are coming up, that should happen. And my vision is to 030. They, I mean, the surrounding villages or the community around industry and we included, 
should be able to open the tap and drink the water. Thank you. That's a really wonderful vision, I must say, Raghav. Uh, Mr. Nanda, how about your vision? So, I have a larger vision of, uh, you know, getting all the rivers in the entire world, uh, you know, good water quality. But uh, uh, I would like to see at least the main rivers, the main, uh, the main basins mm, should be, you know, healthy ecosystem should be thriving in them. And um, that's my vision. I'm working slowly towards that. Mm, I'll reach somewhere. Definitely. And I think we all are together in that journey and, and we all will try and make it happen. Um, Manoj, your, your vision statement, please. Sure. Uh, you know, water is often called the plague of uh, climate change. Nine out of 10 disa natural disasters are some way or the other related to water. If we can control the water, both from the way it's uh, you know, available and accessed, we have a much better and healthier uh, water uh, and a healthier uh, world to live in. There's a very interesting data that a few weeks back I read that 20% of savings in water will, will lead to one gigatons of carbon savings. And when I, what really got my attention was that is 2 billion barrels of crude oil saved. That's huge. I mean, you can, you, you can directly connect it. You know, 72% of our energy in India comes from fossil fuel. Raghavji has done tremendous work in trying to preserve the ecosystem. Only 12% of it is hydro, if I'm correct. If we can conserve water, we can actually be more self energy efficient without having to become leaving a, bad, a worse carbon footprint. That's my vision. Thank you. Thanks, Manoj. I think again, uh, you know, it's, it's a wonderful vision to have. And as I said, uh, and I probably I would be reiterating myself, it's always good to have a vision, but it's, it's even better to bring along partners who will join you to make sure that the vision is realized. And I think uh, the wonderful forum that Fiki has provided us all, uh, this would act as a catalyst for all of us to work towards that vision. Uh, thank you very much for you know, participating in today's discussion and sharing your experiences. I think it, it has been a, an invigorating session and to sum up the conversation, I would probably like to again reiterate my initial observation where I said that there is growing investment by corporates, both in terms of efforts and resources towards making water accessible, but need to do more towards quality issues highlighted by uh, most of you. Uh, it is important for also corporates to look at water as a long-term investment as it require a mid to long-term roadmap to reverse the issues of you know, pertaining to groundwater, climate change, all that we have talk talked about. On behavior change, I think it is important to see the communities as partners, not beneficiary. And uh, we are coming to appreciate water as a source of business risk and that uh, water management is good for business. And, and, and maybe corporate needs to play a critical role in the chain of government, private solution providers, civil society, community participation to ensure all players perform uh, their role well to support SDG. Thanking you once again for your participation and sharing your experience and best practices. Uh, over to you, Rita. Uh, thank you very much for that very, very exciting panel discussion and so many different uh, you know pointers that were made by the excellent panelists today um, I would just like to close by thanking all the distinguished speakers our chair co-chair Mr. Marwa from the Central Groundwater Board uh, Sangeeta yourself for moderating this uh, wonderful session and uh, also to the uh, panelists Mr. Trivedi, Mr. Nanda and Mr. Gulati uh, I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Nestle. And of course, thanks to all the participants who joined us from various stakeholder groups, not just corporates, but NGOs, foundations, government. We have different kinds of participants from academia, 
Uh, so lots of, uh, you know, interesting stakeholders who joined us today for this uh, discussion. And I would just end by reiterating what our chair began uh, by saying or what she ended uh, with in her statement that the scope for corporates to make water a priority in this decade of action uh, is, is immense and it is now and it can only be achieved through robust partnerships. So we in the FIKI Water Mission uh, really look forward to partnering with all willing stakeholders towards promoting corporate water stewardship. So with that, uh, we'll conclude today's webinar and wish you all a very happy uh, World Water Day. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, thank you. Thank Wishing you the well. same. Yeah. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good session. Thanks.